are so excited to have each and every one of you here this morning. I invite you to stand as we worship the Lord in freedom.
up here. We could go in the back and do warm ups or faster. <laughs> we might not be able to talk. <laughs> we are so glad each of you are here. Rob could save us, sure. Anyways, isn't it a beautiful day? Amen. <laughs> isn't it a beautiful day? Yeah. Ah, Lord, they woke it up. Okay, so here we go. Um, we're really concerned because. Tell them about this, what they're supposed to do. Yeah. <laughs> are these in the back or by the? I don't even know where they are. They're on the table. Oh, they're on the table. Connection Center? Build an inventory. So it's a uh, gift and skills inventory we'd like everybody to fill out. Um, there's obviously a lot of things we need help with in the church, um, a wide range of stuff. This would kind of help us decide where to plug you in if you're interested in getting plugged in, um, what type of things that you would fall into. So if you guys could pick one of these up and fill it out and turn it back in, that would be awesome. Yeah, because we don't want you to do something you don't want to do. Because I had to paint the other day in the hallway, and I had it at, on here, on here. Remember that, Dan? And I was, he was like, just wash it out. He had to come out. But, um, question, just so you know, and Rick, where's Rick? You're going to be so excited. Tom Ruther and Jeff were able to work their magic with some old systems, and we were able to, oh, sorry, thank you, Pastor. We were able to kick off youth group last week. Woo! That was so awesome! Okay, we'll have a video next week, but it was packed out. I wish I could show pictures, but Charlie was there witnessing it. This is the coolest thing. Um, we're starting to have kids come and just be able to do homework together and just hang out in fellowship. And uh, we were just talking, and the kids were like, I can't believe the church did this for us. Like, and one of the, the students were like, they don't even know us. How, why would they give money to that? And it was just an amazing thing. Of, I'm like, yeah. And then we get, were able to talk about That's why we tithe and have offerings, so that for generations it can go on and go on and go on. So Amen. we're so appreciative because – if it wasn't for all you faithful givers, I mean, that building went to happen, and the kids were literally like, it just was amazing. Oh, it's not supposed to be up there. Just, it's good. Good. We'll, you'll have the video video next year. No, it's supposed to be. So, so it, was, it was pretty cool because when all the kids were in here, they've been in here for so long that they all have their, like, space that they go to during worship or during the message or whatever, and Jeff brought it up before his message, watching those kids in that new building not have any idea of where they thought they should stand and stuff <laughs> was actually quite funny, but it was just a tremendous turnout. Um, thank you all so much. Um, many of you know I'm involved with it too as one of the youth leaders, and those kids truly do appreciate it, and it's just going to be awesome to see where it goes from here. Um, personally, my small group has averaged 18, um, and that's ninth grade boys only. Wow. And it's been really cool. It's been really cool to see, just so you guys understand the impact you're having, not just on the youth in this church but outside in this community because there's new kids that those kids in our group are inviting that I'm having a hard time keeping up with names and stuff because there's new kids coming awesome. all the time. So just understand it's not just the youth in this church that you're affecting. This has become a true outreach program into the community as well. And it's not just the kids, family show up here and it's just a lot of awesome things that are gonna happen out of this. So thank you very much. Yeah, which gets us to when we're over there, Pastor Michael with small groups can get this building, men's ministry, women's ministry, nursery, all that is opening up so we can have, I mean, I figured there's seven spaces in here on a Wednesday night that adults can have classes or small groups just to have that fellowship too. And I know you're excited about that, right, Pastor? And then Amy could be doing worship practice on a Wednesday night too to free up another family night. And it's just like... Amazing what will happen when, since the building, this whole building could be, the whole town could be like, what's going on? <laughs> and so, the, the, the younger, younger kids are over there right now. Oh, the younger ones the, are over there the right now? the kids' building. It's yes, so cool. Yes, it's their first, first day. day. Yep. yep. So we're thankful and so glad you guys are each here. Amen. Amen.
That's so amazing good. news. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I tell you, I am so excited about that. And let you know, we are going to be having a dedication Sunday coming up. We don't know when yet. Uh, yes, we're using the building. There's sti still a few small details to be done yet. Uh, but hopefully soon we can give you a date to do a special kind of dedication celebration of what God's done. Well, I'll let you know what's going on next week because I, I am pumped. We have a very special guest with us. Uh, we actually have someone that does uh, mission work in a closed access country, meaning in a country where legally they're not allowed to share the gospel. And uh, this person will be with us here next Sunday telling the story of what God is doing. I, I cannot actually say the name of, of who it is because we're on camera right now. And because of this, a closed access country, if you're watching online, uh, the video, we will not be airing next week's video because of the sensitive nature of what's going to be shared. Uh, but it's going to be an amazing Sunday. I want to invite you to join us. Also, later that evening at uh, 6 o'clock, we're going to have a gathering here at church. Just lay back, snacks, have a chance just to talk to her, get to know her better, hear more details about what God is doing. So I invite you to be a part of that as we celebrate our missions conference next week. Well, generally, on the fourth Sunday of the month, uh, we do a missions focus, and they'll be happening next week, but we're going to do it today also. I want to show you a video of uh, Kama Services. Kama is a, a branch of our denomination of their missions work that they provide relief, disaster relief. And no missions doesn't just happen overseas, it happens here too. And this is a story of how God is using Kama to minister in the midst of the forest fires, in, at least in one community in Oregon. So I'm going to pray for us and take a look at the screen. We're going to watch that video. Why don't you join me in prayer? Father, we do want to thank you for this morning. And Father, we celebrate this new building and how you provide it, and now we get to use it. And Father, we're looking forward to all the ways you're going to use that to draw people into your kingdom. Uh oh, Father, I, you have been so good to us. And Lord, even as the kids are spending their first Sunday there right now, we pray you be with them, that you bless them during this time. And Father, as we continue in the service uh, with the music, with the teaching, with just our fellowship, may you be worshipped by what happens. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Hey, take a look at the screen. <clears throat> and we started seeing smoke coming in um, to my mobile home park in Medford, Oregon. I grabbed the hose and I thought, well, I'll spray my roof. I'll just defend my house. And my daughter called, no, that's ridiculous. You know, it, it, you just got to leave, you know. I left, and then at 2 in the morning, I got a call that your smoke alarm's going off. That's the time it burnt my house down at 2 in the morning on September 8th. We had 43 people show up, the two mayors, one from Talent, one from Phoenix. We had representatives from United Way, from Red Cross, all showed up and said, hey, we're in this together. Let's get together and support this. As kind of that first group to get everybody together, we became a center or a hub for other members of the community to further help others. It was in the early afternoon. I was actually driving this bus, and I saw a puff of smoke start to come up south of our town. But our buses go into the trailer parks, go into where the apartment complexes are, and we bring them food. And when this bus pulled in here, hundreds of children hollered, it's the bus, and it's bus driver Lee. Lee goes through the areas that have been affected. He knows these families, and if he sees them, he say, hey, can I take you back to the expo? Can I take you somewhere, you know, you can get help? I don't want to cry, but I'm in my house for 12 years. So, my memories are gone here. And traffic was all stopped. We couldn't get out, and traffic was all stopped. We couldn't get out, and since I'm wearing an orange vest as a bus driver, they think I'm somebody in authority, and the people run up, what can we do, what can we do? I actually told about 25, 30 cars that were behind me. I said, if this gets closer, just follow me. We're gonna drive through these meadows. We're gonna knock down these, fit. I'm sorry, but we'll be okay. The best way to put it is, Lee is the face of the eye care campaign. I'm the force behind it. We contacted people and then we contacted and it went through our network of alliances. But in just the last week, we have given out over, I think we're up to, hey, Kevin, where are you? As of this morning, $16,400 in gift cards. In gift cards. Then we had someone donate $14,000 worth of haircuts. 
We got a couple left. Good, you need a haircut. All right, well, back to this. The eye care campaign is just starting because the needs are going to be here for a long time. There's really two types of leadership in, in situation like this. Uh, we've seen the instantaneous response type of leadership. Then there are also those whose care is for the long term. After the media is gone, after the press has died down, we are looking at is being here for the long term, the next month, next six months, next two years. Because when the news cycle ends, the pain and the devastation and the loss is still here even though we don't see it in the news anymore. If we can show that compassion and respect to everyone and build those bridges so that the truth of Christ can be shared, then there's nothing better in this world. I used to think in my negative side, I don't deserve. Now he's showing me, I can hardly say it. You do, you do. You not only deserve, but you're gonna get three times the blessing. Our God isn't the God that avoids the crisis. Our God is the God that holds our hand and walks us through the crisis. We'll meet physical needs, but we care more about the soul. We're an Acts 1-8 family, right? That's what we do. We'll see a story come out of more and more people who experience Jesus Christ for the first time in their lives, even though they encountered him in perhaps the toughest or darkest night of their life. The song we're going to sing right now asks at the beginning, do you feel the world is broken? And we answer, we do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. I think watching that video, we can see that darkness. And then it asks, but do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. And do you wish that you could see it all made new? And we answer, we do. So I invite you to stand as we praise the God who is so worthy of the of our praise for what he's doing in the lives of youth here in Pearl, Minnesota, for what he's doing in people in the United States and all around the world. I just want to give him all the praise this morning. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Feel the shadows deepen. We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you we wish, wish that you could, could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. And is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves Revelation 5, verses 1 to 13, really explain what the next part of the song is going to talk about. It says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. 
and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that it is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. So as we go to answer this question, is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory, is he worthy of this? He is. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move? Does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those he loves? Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. To answer the question, is anyone worthy? Is anyone worthy?
the splendor of the King. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself. This next song we're going to sing is going to be a new one for our church. And um, when they made this song, they called it, when they made the music video for it, they called it, they're cultivating a worship experience. And what they had was a group of people singing out the chorus and the bridge. And then the rest of it really has some different vocal parts. We're going to do our best um, to do. But I, right now, as a church, I want you guys to kind of be a part of that cultivating a worship experience. So I want to teach you the chorus and the bridge before we sing this song. It basically, the song is called Promises, and it talks about great is your faithfulness. So the chorus goes like this. I want you to sing it with me as soon as you think you get it. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun 
unto the setting same, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. That was awesome. Good job, guys. And then the bridge says, it goes, I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. Sing that again. Ready? I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope. So I want you to sing those out when we get to that part. Faithful through the ages. God of Abraham. You're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Ooh. Time and time again, you have proven that you do just what you say. And though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to
that we would remember that you are a God who keeps his promises. You're the God of covenant. You've shown that over and over again in your word. We trust you, Lord. We trust your spirit and what you're going to do here today. Give us ears to hear your truth. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. could help us get as much light as we can in here. If you're by the windows, if you could raise up the blinds. 
And I, I especially want to thank one person. Maddie, it has been a blessing to have you here, and you're leaving us to go to Oklahoma. Uh, we're going to try to stop you, but this is her, her last Sunday playing keyboard with us. So, so one character I am fascinated with in the Bible is David. You have a man that's described as being a man after God's own heart. Can you imagine having that said of you? being called a man or a woman after God's own heart. Or uh, when you get into the Old Testament, kind of the following story of Israel with later kings, David is the gold standard by which they're constantly compared to. Like, for example, when David's great-grandson Abijah becomes king, it says this. He's described this way. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of his forefather David had been. When his son Asa becomes king, it says this, Asa did it was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done. Years later, you have King Amaziah, he did it was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father David had, had done. I mean, think about it this way. Uh, you know, Kurt, you're sitting right there. What high school did you go to? Breckenridge, Minnesota. Breckenridge High School. And, and can I ask what year did you graduate? You don't have to tell me if you don't want to, but... Okay, so 1964, can, can you imagine, uh, you know, the people there in Breckenridge talking about this year's class and saying, you know, this year's class, they're pretty good, but I tell you, they're not like the class back when Kurt was in high school. You know, if every year you made that comparison, that, that's the kind of guy that David was. And, you know, when I think about that, I ask, man, what kind of man leaves behind that kind of a legacy? Now, David wasn't perfect. He messed up quite a bit, but he got a lot of things right. And I just kind of asked, what was his secret sauce? What is the secret sauce to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? Uh, we've been doing this series this fall called The Story, looking at a piece of the Old Testament. Uh, Joshua through 2 Samuel. We're actually in the 2 Samuel now, so we're actually close to the end. Um, but we're doing it for two reasons. Number one, uh, knowing that I mean, this is the story of God's redemption of humanity. Uh, we're trying to look at a big picture to understand this book better. But also, as we look at these stories, understanding more of who God is and what God says about us being his people. And we start off with the people of Israel. They made this covenant with God. God had given them this role. They were to be a kingdom of priests. They were to point the world toward God. Uh, last week, we looked at two individuals, King Saul, the first king of Israel, and David, the man who to replace him, and suggested that you had uh, two very different characters illustrating two different directions that the people of Israel could go. You had Saul who, I mean, Saul worshipped God, but suddenly he cared about much more deeply. Saul's mission was to build up his own glory, was for his name to be great throughout the world. Saul was the type of guy, he loved the spotlight. Most dangerous place to be was between him and a camera. And it didn't turn out so well. Uh, his drive for greatness led to tyranny, it led to destruction. And that was one direction if Israel were decided to care more about their own glory instead of serving God, that's the direction they could go. But then there was David, this man who above all else, he wanted to see God honored. And David serves as illustration of who Israel could be. In 2 Samuel, you have the story of David's kingship. And especially in the first half, you get a glimpse of who Israel can be when they make God front and central. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of 2 Samuel. We'll be starting in chapter 6. While you're turning there, let me give you a little of a background. Uh, we've been encouraging you during this series to be reading the Bible on your own. And uh, some of you, maybe you've been reading totally other areas, but some of you have been reading through these books as we study them. And uh, if you've been reading 2 Samuel, it kind of has a, a rough start. It starts out with David becoming king, but it's really not that easy because uh, when David is made king, he's only made king over a part of Israel. There's another part of Israel that... Saul, the previous king, they make his youngest son king. And there's this bloody civil war. And there's people who are killed left and right. It's really violent. And you read these stories and you ask, okay, God, well, what are you saying here? How in the world does this apply to my life? I mean, if David was your man, why is his extension so violent? And there's a reason for this. 
God had told the Israelites long before that when it came to choosing a king, they were to choose the king that God would appoint. And God had anointed David as king. People knew about that. In fact, King Saul, his oldest son, Jonathan, had recognized that. Old son, Jonathan, knew that David was going to be the next king. But what happens is when Saul dies, you have a group of people for political reasons. Maybe they're part of Saul's family, Saul's tribe. They like Saul being king. They get perks from that. So they say, we don't care who God anointed. We're going to keep Saul's family in power. So that's why they make Saul's youngest son king. And there is this bloody war. A lot of people die. Why? Because whenever you go outside of God's plan, there is always a consequence. And for Israel going outside of God's plan, trying to circumvent him... It's a mess. And that's the point you see early on in the book. Well, David ends up um, the king over all Israel. It takes some time, but it gets to that point. Once he's consolidated power and moved into his capital city, David then gets to focus on the things that he wants to focus on, the things that define his kingship. Let's take a look at chapter 6, starting in verse 1. And we're not going to read the whole chapter 6. We're going to jump around a little bit. Verse 1. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala and Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim of the Ark. Now pause there a moment. <clears throat> the Ark, this was something that God had told Moses to build back when Moses was in charge. It would be a symbol of God's presence among Israel. Now, there had been an incident that had happened about 60 years before that uh, basically the people didn't know what to do with the ark. They didn't know where to put it. So we're just hanging out at some guy's farm. And David says, hey, we have a capital city now. Let's bring this to the capital city. Verse 3. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord. With castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. You got this massive celebration going on. You got this concert taking place. They are so excited that the ark is coming to Jerusalem. Now, if you continue to read the story, you find out that uh, David makes a bit of a mistake that God had given explicit instructions about how to move the ark, that God was supposed to be treated with respect. And David was so excited about this, he didn't take the time to read the instructions. Mistakes are made. Someone actually ends up dying. They end up having to stop the celebration. Now, you skip ahead. A little time later, David figures out what, went, what goes wrong and uh, decides it's time to try again. Let's look at verse 12. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Abed-Edom and everything he has because the Ark of God. That's where the Ark was. So David went to bring up the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David, rejoicing. When those who were carrying the Ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bowl and fat and calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. While he and all of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. <coughs> After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls, uh, of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. <coughs> Sorry about the cough. <coughs> David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father, or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. Now get this line. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. 
but by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. After Michael's daughter Saul had, had no children to the day of her death. You know, this whole event. <coughs> Second, is Amy, Rob, can you get me? Thank you, Roxanne. <coughs> Got a, the joy of getting a cough. Would you like a cough drop? I think this will help. Thank you. She is. She's pretty amazing. <laughs> you know, what marks me about this event is you have David, man, celebrating. He can't get enough of worshiping God. I mean, even when his wife is saying, you're so undignified, you're the king. I mean, you have a reputation to maintain. David says, I don't care about my reputation. All I care about is God, my true king, being honored. And for David, I would suggest that this is something that started early in his life that leads up to this point. I mean, when it comes to David, you got this, it begins with a heart for worship. Uh, one thing that I, I love about Scripture, you get to the book of Psalms, and you have all these prayers and worship songs that David wrote throughout his life. And some of these that he wrote at, as a young man, even as a boy, out taking care of his sheep, just meditating on the greatness of God. Like, I want to show you one. This is Psalm 8. David writes this, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care, care for them. You got David, even as a boy, he's out there just looking at the stars and thinking, wow, God, God, you made that. And God, you love me. D David, the more he meditated on that, the more he just wanted to worship God, the more he wanted to see God praised. And throughout this story, you see David, his desire is to worship. Now, I think it starts here, but it flows into something else. Uh, one little Bible study tip that for you is, uh, you know, when you read the story of David and 2 Samuel, the story of King David, uh, if you go ahead a few books in the Bible, you find a book called 1 Chronicles. And 1 Chronicles actually is a retelling of the story of David's kingship. It adds in some more details. And when you find this story in 1 Chronicles, it tells you a little more behind the scenes. What is David thinking when he brings the ark to Jerusalem? He, he says this, and... Uh, 1 Chronicles 13, 3. Let us bring the ark back to us, for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. So this is interesting. Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's presence. Uh, you know, back in the former days, that they'd inquire of it, that it was a symbol of God's leadership. And good old King Saul, who, you know, his focus above all else, making his name great, he doesn't ever inquire of it. Saul's very clear that Saul's the one in charge, not God. For David, who begins with this heart of worship, he gets a sense that, man, if God's made me king, I don't want to do this on my own. No, God's the one that placed me here, and God's the one true king. So we need the Ark of the Covenant here in Jerusalem because we don't want to make any decision without God's direction. Essentially, you have this. You have the submission to God's leadership. It starts with worship, then goes to this. It goes to submitting to God's leadership. Now, if you go to the next chapter here in 2 Samuel, David's not done. Because David's heart of worship doesn't end when they bring the ark there. There is far more that he wants to do to glorify God. Take a look at chapter 7. We'll start in verse 1. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. Here's what David has in mind. You know, uh, throughout the world, in different nations, they would whatever gods, false gods they worship, they would build temples for them. And the main purpose of a temple was, you know, a way for them to encounter that God. That's where you'd go to pray. Um, David, and he's not looking for that. He has the ark. He can talk to God wherever he wants. But he's thinking, why is it that these other countries, 
They build testaments of their God's greatness. And we have the one true God. We can do even better than they can. That This city should have a structure, should have a temple, something that the whole world can see that shows them how great our God, the creator of the universe, is. Now, David doesn't end up building it. God actually tells him not to do it. God's going to have the son Solomon build it. But I want to go back to 1 Chronicles again. Uh, when David is gathering supplies to build this, he gives a little bit of his intentions. 25.5, a house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificence and fame and splendor in the sight of who? In the sight of all nations. See, for David, it's not just enough for God to be worshipped. It's not just enough for God to be in charge of Israel. He wants the whole world to know how great their God is. And that's why he wants to take on this grand project of building the temple. His mission is to make God famous among the nations. Now, after uh, David begins this project, or at least wants to, God speaks to him, I want you to see God's response. Verse 5, go and tell my servant David, this is God talking to the prophet, prophet Nathan, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any one of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then. Tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. Now, pause there a moment. God's making this promise. David, I'm going to make your name great. Remember back to Saul last week? What was it that Saul wanted? Above all else, Saul wanted to make his name great, and he was going to do whatever it took. He was going to kill whoever it took to seize that power, to seize that greatness, and didn't work out so well for him. But here you have David. David, he's not on that mission. David wants to see God's name made great. And what does God do? God gives him what Saul wanted. God essentially says, David, because of your heart for me, you're going to share in my glory. God honors those who seeks to place his name above all else. God's response is to make David's name great. There's one more thing that God does. Let's go to verse 11 here. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring and succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom he is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will